Good evening, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the 2022 Hamilton County School Board Debates. My name is Carrie Randolph, and I'm the Executive Director of Chattanooga 2.0. To begin, I would like to draw your attention to the closed captioning feature on your video player, which will turn on subtitles should you need or prefer them. In 2015, Chattanooga 2.0 started as a movement to transform education and workforce development outcomes from birth to career. We have since grown to a community-wide network of organizations collaborating across sectors, working to ensure that children and youth in Hamilton County have access to quality education and career opportunities to help them realize their full potential. I'd like to thank our partners, the Chattanooga Times Free Press and Local 3 News for co-hosting these critically important debates alongside us. I'd also like to thank our District 3 candidates, Jen Pyroth and Joe Smith for participating in this important conversation this evening and for their interest in serving on behalf of students, families, and teachers on the Hamilton County School Board. Both candidates for District 3 answered some candidate profile questions and Jen Pyroth filled out our educational equity questionnaire ahead of tonight's debate. If you'd like to read their full responses, visit chat2, that's C-H-A-T-T, -T, the number two, dot org slash vote. Chattanooga 2.0 was born out of our recognition that strong educational outcomes, birth through career, are essential to our community's economic growth and progress and require community-wide commitment and action. We believe that strong leadership at all levels of the educational system is necessary to our success as a community, and we recognize just how important these races are during today's challenging times and into the future. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you candidates for your willingness to serve our community in such a vital way. And without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce David Carroll of Local 3 News and Dave Flessner of the Chattanooga Times Free Press, who will be moderating this evening's debate. David and Dave. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate that. And our thanks to the candidates as well. Joe and Jen, thank you so much for being a part of this. And also to all of you watching from home or on your mobile device, wherever you may be. Both candidates will leave their cameras and microphone on at all times during the debate. Each candidate will be given two minutes to make an opening statement. Dave Flessner and I will then alternate asking uh, several questions this evening, depending upon the time we have, with additional questions uh, throughout the evening as uh, offered by some of the shareholders in District 3. Now, at the end, each candidate will pose a question of their choosing to their opponent. Whatever they want to ask is all good. Each candidate will be given one minute to respond to each question, an optional 30-second rebuttal if the moderators feel it's appropriate. Now, candidates, when your time is up, you'll hear a loud noise. Sometimes it's a bell, sometimes it's a train whistle, or it could just be a person, but you will get a signal when your time is up. Also, the time your time begins as soon as you begin speaking. And once time has expired at the end of an answer, the moderator can choose to allow a candidate to complete a sentence, but we will not allow candidates to start a new thought at that point. Dave, hello. 
Good evening, and thank you, candidates, again. My, let me send my welcome to you as well. We appreciate you doing this, and each of you as candidates at the conclusion of our forum tonight will be given the opportunity to make a closing two-minute statement. As moderators, David and I will have may ask questions to clarify a particular statement or explain a point as needed. Candidates may not use the internet, cell phone, or any other outside assistance to answer questions during tonight's debate. The goal of our debate is simply to introduce the candidates of District 3 and their platforms. Candidates will conduct themselves, we hope, in a respectful manner and not use derogatory language. And to begin our forum, we will start with an opening statement in alphabetical order and then alternate who finishes first and who answers first in each of the alternating questions. Candidates, as we begin, are there any questions, Joe or Jen, that you have about the debate rules? Nope. Well, if not, Jen Broth, you're up first. You have two minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi to all my uh, hearing people. <laughs> I wanted to address the deaf community. First, I'm a sign language interpreter, uh, as, as you can see. I'm also the mom of four children uh, here in Hickson who all go to their zoned school. I am a former employee of uh, Hamilton County Schools. I was an American Sign Language interpreter at Hickson Elementary. I have a bachelor's degree in elementary education. I have a master's degree in mental health counseling. I am here and I am running for school board because I believe that our students don't feel safe and protected in our schools. I'm here and running because our teachers are not being paid equal to their education or their positive impact on our community. I'm here because politicians can't or won't see the crisis of our schools crumbling down around our children. I'm here because we fund our schools $3,000 less per student per year than the national average. I am here because I couldn't sit at home and tell my kids that I did nothing while the best the board could do was form a committee. I am fired up and I am ready to serve. Thank you. All right, Jim, thank you. Joe Smith, you have two minutes to make your opening statement. Let me first say thank you to Chattanooga 2.0 and to the Times Free Press and also to uh, uh, Local 3 News and Dave and David. Thank you guys, glad to be here. Joe Smith, and I promise that's not fictitious. That really is my name. I've been serving here in District 3 for the last six years, first appointed to an unexpired uh, term by former board member, uh, now State Representative Greg Martin. And, and when I, I finished that term, then ran uh, for another term, 2018, and the taxpayers in, in District 3 saw fit to hire me. And uh, so I'm running again, looking forward to serving another four years. Uh, my wife, Paula, who I call Miss America, been married 47 years, two grown children of our own. We've raised 19 foster children, and that's why I have all this white hair. Uh, but I like nothing more uh, than working with hurting kids and families. It's been my, it's been my life's work. Uh, was the founder and director of the YCAP program that, that most people in Chattanooga know about. My son runs that program today. Tried to retire back in 17, didn't do retirement very well. Had a good time for about a year and a half and then had to go back to work. So I'm now the executive director of Prison Prevention Ministries. And we're in the schools every day. We run a program called End Zone for kids in the Hickson area that are struggling academically and behaviorally. So uh, all the teachers, the principals uh, up in District 3, they know my work. Uh, and I am uh, uh, so excited for the opportunity to serve again. Glad to be here. Thank you guys for doing this. And I uh, welcome uh, my opponent, Ms. Peroth. All right, thank you both. Let's get started. First question will be answered first by Jen Peroth. And it's on the topic of school spending. It's a little complicated. Here we go. Tennessee's new school funding formula, known as TISA, TISA, will infuse a one-time $250 million investment in educational spending statewide starting this fall. After that, $750 million in recurring funds will be dispersed in the fiscal years 2023 and 2024. 
Hamilton County Schools is projected to receive $397 million in fiscal year 2024. That's $47 million more than the system will receive this academic year. TISA is a funding formula, not a spending formula. That's the key to the question. It will be up to the school board to determine how funds are allocated to schools within Hamilton County School District. So, Jen Pyroth, you go first. As a school board member, how would you advise these funds be equitably allocated to schools both in your district and across the entire county? I am very glad that you mentioned the word equity. Uh, there is a big difference between uh, equity and fairness. Uh, fairness is when we give everyone the same thing. Every kid gets a lollipop. Uh, and equity is when every kid gets what they need. So my heart is with children with disabilities. I've been advocating for kids with disabilities for almost three decades. And working, I don't know if you all know this, but in uh, Hamilton County, every child pre-K through graduation in 12th grade is brought to District 3 uh, if they need sign language services. So those children go to either Hickson Elementary, Hickson Middle, or Hickson High School. So uh, for example, I'm just using those kids as an example, those kids would need more funding than uh, kids who can hear in, in general. Uh, also, uh, I think we definitely need to be looking more at hiring uh, more uh, more workers. Was that was that the time? That was the time. You, you wow! One minute. Oh, one back. minute. I'm sorry. I thought it was two minutes. Excuse me. It goes Go back. ahead. Yeah, I know. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Jen. Joe Smith, your answer to that, please. Well, for years the the state funded us through the BEP, which nobody understood. <laughs> it was the most complicated process that there could have possibly have been. And then for years, we, we ranked somewhere around 45th, 44th, 45th in the nation in terms of per, uh, per student funding. Now, the TISA, we're going to find when the numbers come out, we've improved that quite a bit. Now, the, the good thing about the TISA does exactly uh, what you said in your lead up to the question it's more of a student-based funding. So the dollars are going to be placed in the areas where there's the biggest need, and, and that needs to happen. So that can help uh, close uh, some of the equity gaps that we uh, constantly are talking about. So uh, it's exciting and uh, that we're, we're going to have an a, a influx of dollars to do uh, some things that we hadn't been able to do in the past. All right, Jim, do you have a rebuttal for that? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that I've heard actually from uh, the teachers that I've spoken with that TISA is even harder to understand than BEP. So I, I think we all have a lot to learn here. All right, Dave. Well, thank you both for that response. And Joe Smith, the second question goes to you first. And when we put out the call for questions to the community, many came back wanting to know what the school board would do about bullying in the school. Hamilton County Schools has a discipline policy, yet parents, students, and teachers have voiced concerns that bullying persists. What policy changes, if any, would you see that the school board should make to reduce bullying in our schools? Well, you know, it's a great question, certainly concern. And we've had a lot of parents come before the school board with sharing episodes of where children have been bullied. We've got programs that in our school to to address bullying the uh the interesting thing about two years ago we uh, uh we came up with a code of conduct that uh, uh everybody was trained to uh to follow and to do uh that everybody understood seemingly that we call our code of acceptable behavior our principals all across the district are given some autonomy with regard to how they run their particular school. But that code of conduct helps them to know what they should be doing in terms of discipline issues. I've said all along, continue to say, and if anybody pays attention to, to our meetings, every time this comes up, I'm always saying the problem is we're not following our code of conduct and our acceptable behavior. 
And this is one of the things that I want to get done in this next term. We've got to change the culture of our schools in terms of behavior. Thank you, Joe. Jen, what, what should we do to stop bullying in schools? Well, I don't know if any of you all have been on social media lately, <laughs> but uh, in my opinion and my professional opinion, uh, kids copy adults and we have a bullying problem in general. Uh, running for school board has been very eye-opening for me as a first-time candidate. Uh, people are vicious, absolutely vicious online. And so I think that we need to start with emphasizing kindness and respect, even with people that we disagree with. As adults, kids are watching. We also need to um, make sure that kids have access to uh, that, that kids have access to being able to uh, talk about their feelings. They have training about how to talk about their feelings in school. You know, just as we teach them math and reading, I'd say learning how to be a good citizen, which means being able to talk about things reasonably, uh, is just as important as, as all of those things. So I think we need to focus on uh, maybe getting some more mental health professionals. I also want to see us focusing on citizenship awards more than things like perfect attendance. Thank you. Any rebuttal, Joe? Any well, I, you know, we we've got to do a better job of holding students accountable and not just holding the students accountable, but the parents holding them accountable. Uh, but we've got to get we've got to get a hold of this acting out behavior because it's disrupting the entire milieu for students who want to learn. Right. On the topic of school safety, a community member of District 3 had this question. The school board and county commission are now investing money to station a school resource officer, or in some cases, a school safety officer in as many schools as possible, hopefully every school, if they can find the folks. What is your view, and Jen, this goes to you first, what is your view on school resource officers or school safety officers in every building? Is that enough to keep our students safe? If not, what more can you do as a school board member? Jen Pyroff. Thank you. Uh, so my father's a retired police officer and hi dad, he's watching. <laughs> I have, uh, so I have a lot of respect for police officers. At the same time, no, I do not think in any way that that is uh, sufficient. We've seen that, uh, I mean, we've had, there were school police officers uh, at Parkland High School, which is actually quite close to where I grew up. Uh, that officer didn't do anything. Uh, there were a bunch of police officers outside the Uvalde uh, Elementary School who didn't go in and, and help anybody for over an hour. So that does not necessarily guarantee safety in any way. I want to make sure that our students who are, our students and teachers that are learning out of portables are able to uh, quickly get out of portables and into a secure building. That's definitely much a much better idea and much safer for those kids. Uh, if we're talking about school safety, we need to talk about buildings. The infrastructure is atrocious, and I'm sure we'll get to that later, but I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that because that is a huge safety issue. All right, Joe Smith, your turn. Well, in an ideal world, we'd love to have an SRO in every school, simply because they're better trained, experienced, and and they're, you know, they're sworn police officers, and um, it'd be great to have an SRO in every school. The problem has been uh, Sheriff Hammond has just, he hadn't been able to find those guys to, to put them in there. He's had some funding in place to increase the number of SROs, but he just hadn't been able to find them. Now, about three years ago, when Dr. Johnson was here, we took steps to harden the entries to all of our schools. So I spent a lot of time in all eight of our schools up here in District 3. And if you go to one of those schools, it's like getting into Fort Knox if you go in the front door. Now, what's to say, you know, people could leave a, a door open or something uh, uh, around the side of the building, the back of the building. But but we've taken a lot of steps over the last three years to harden our entrances to the front door. And, and that I'm very pleased about. And I'm also very pleased that at least we're going to have some security officers in every single school. And and we're taking steps to, to hire those guys now. Every parent my case, every grandparent uh, wants to make sure their children are safe when they go to school. All right, Jen, do you have anything to add to that or rebuttal? 
I just have a lot of concern about uh, kids feeling uh, like they're in uh, <laughs> a, a feeling less free than I would like them to feel. All right. I have concern about that. All right, this next question, we'll go to Joe first. And um, you knew we'd get to a hot potato here pretty soon. So get ready for this one. This is a hot topic in our community. It's about uh, the possibility of establishing a technical school downtown. And this is about priorities. So Joe, starting with you, you'll have a minute to answer this. How would you prioritize a new technic technical school downtown over the close to $1 billion in the facilities needs of existing schools? Well, we've got a lot of needs and uh, we've known this really ever since merger. And we've continued to kick the can down the road, if you will. Uh, we've made a start and, and we built some new schools or renovating some others. You're going to hear an announcement from the county commission in the next day or two, fixing to invest some dollars up in our district and repair some things and uh, give some things that, that, that we need. Vocational education, I think, is vitally important. Not every child wants to go to college or chooses to go to college. And now there's, uh, in a lot of those technical fields, uh, young people can make a very, very good wage. So that's just something that we're going to have to dissect and, and see where we put first, what we put first. I'm hoping that the community will get interested in this and join hands with us to help us. All right, Jim, how about your priorities on this? I absolutely could not disagree more. Uh, I used to work for the state of Tennessee as a vocational rehab counselor. I helped deaf and hard of hearing people get jobs. And in that uh, field when I worked there, I was able to go to quite a number. They used to be called Tennessee Technology Centers. Now they're called TCATs. Uh, that's a Tennessee uh, College of Accessible Technolo uh, Applied Technology. And uh, there are 27 of those campuses all over the state of Tennessee. There are also the one right here in Chattanooga at Chat State has 19 different vocational programs. And it is covered by Tennessee Promise. There are select schools that are already doing dual enrollment. Uh, that is a complete waste of taxpayer funds. I am entirely against it. I can't believe we're even talking about it when we have, like you said, almost a billion dollars of repairs that we need to do uh, for the rest of our kids. Terrible idea. All right, any rebuttal? Well, I think, again, the. Uh, you know, it's it's what the taxpayers are going to want to do with their with their money. So we have to listen to them and get feedback from them. And then we'll make the decision of what's most important to the taxpayers. After all, that's who we work for. That's who hires us. Dave? This question comes from a resident in District 3 and he wants to know, what is your position on teaching students uh, on topics such as sexuality and gender identity? First, uh, Jen Broth, how, how to, what, what should we teach about sexuality and gender identity to teachers of any, students of any age? Uh, just like any topic, I think that every single topic that we teach to children should be age appropriate. I think that comprehensive uh, education about uh, what all of our body parts are, uh, it's, it's been shown in research that it keeps children safe, being able to name all their different body parts, you know, be it their arm or their penis or whatever, uh, you know, be, that keeps kids safe because they're able, when something uh, strange might happen, they're able to name uh, what part was touched, you know, God forbid, and uh, to, to report that. It's, it's shown that kids who do not know the names of their body parts are not as safe from uh, sexual predators as they, as kids who know those names. Uh, that said, uh, I think that it is very important that parents are involved and uh, being uh, being the main people who teach about those things. Thank you, Joe Smith. What what should we teach about sexuality and gender identity? And well, you know, I, I I just wish we could in our our you know in public education in schools we need to be teaching math and science and those kind of things. Things about sexuality ought to be done by the parent. You know, I raised a lot of kids and that that was my job and my wife's job. And I'm not so sure that that uh, those things should should be taught in school. Obviously, health and the body and those things, that's fine. 
but in the context of sexuality, uh, that is the parent's job, in my opinion. Jen, any rebuttal to that? No. All right, next, next question. I think we can all agree on this. A great supported teacher in every classroom is critical to the success of students. So here we go. Hamilton County Schools has programs in place to support and retain teachers in our district, but still some of them face burnout. And many teachers, as we've read and heard recently, are outraged by the recent comments by Hillsdale College President Larry Arn, who in many people's views belittled the role of teachers. So in the light of all this controversy going on about whether teachers are appreciated or unappreciated, underpaid, overpaid, how do you propose retaining quality teachers? Would it be a pay increase, fringe benefits, or do you have other ideas? Joe Smith, you got a minute. Every year, David, we lose around 300 to 350 teachers. And it's either to some of them retire, some of them decide to get out of the field uh, for various reasons to go do something else. Some of them are just burnt out like you referenced there. Uh, I took it upon myself the last couple of months to talk to some of those teachers that were leaving and I found just that. Some of them were retiring, but some of them were leaving because of burnout. What was interesting is I asked them, why are, why are you getting out of teaching? Uh, teaching? Teacher pay was not even in the top three. Uh, the very first thing that was on most of their list was the culture of behavior that's going on in our schools. That was number one for most of them. Also, there was a lot of talk about mandated testing that the state requires us to do. You know, teachers spend about 25 or 30 percent of their time doing testing. So that robs uh, instruction time. So we don't have a lot of control over that. That all, that all comes from the state. But I found it interesting that teacher pay was not in the, in the top three for these teachers that are leaving the system. All right, Jen Pyroff, how do you propose retaining the good teachers? Uh, I do think that teacher pay is a huge issue. Um, and I, I'll talk about that more later. But uh, I think that teachers need to feel, I think they are the highest educated and most um, disrespected probably uh, profession out there. I, I have a degree in education. I know that it is not easy to get that degree. Uh, it, I, it was very, very hard for me. <laughs> so uh, I think a, a huge issue aside from the uh, discipline situation is that there are a lot of teachers that I speak to that do not feel supported by the administration. Uh, when they go to the administration for help, uh, they are, you know, told since they need help, they must be a bad teacher or they're ignored. Um, I'm sure administrators are overwhelmed as well. So that, you know, it's not always a case of them being a bad administrator, but th there's so much pressure on schools in general that it's pretty hard for people to take care of each other at this time. And I think it's just so important in any workplace for people to feel supported and to, uh, to have a non-competitive nature with their peers. So uh, in addition to teacher pay, which I think is the most important thing, I also think that those are huge factors. All right, Joe, any rebuttal on that? Second most important relationship in any child's life, second only to the parent, in my opinion, is the classroom teacher. And they, just about every teacher I know, the reason they get in the field is because they've dedicated their life to, uh, to loving on kids. And so we need to love on teachers. And I've done that for the last six years. Just ask the teachers in this district. This next question comes from a Hamilton County resident. How do you view decisions about school curriculum, choice of teaching and reading materials in classrooms and libraries and other matters regarding student instruction being in the purview of parents as opposed to teachers, librarians, and other academic personnel? Jen Proth, this goes to you first. What role, if any, should parents play in shaping curriculum and decisions about what's taught in a classroom? Every caregiver for any child in Hamilton County Schools can go to, uh, to that school and speak with the librarian and choose the books, the subjects, the genres that they do not want their child to read. Uh, there's already, I, I heard a, a candidate in a, in a different district during a debate say, 
well, we have age limits on movies. Why don't we have age limits on books? There are, there always have been. There have always been age limits on books or suggested ages that book that that books are meant for. Uh, I believe in liberty. And for me, liberty means that nobody else gets to decide what my child reads. And just like I don't get to decide what other people's children read. We, be we believe in freedom in America. So uh, for that reason, I, I think it's the, the parent's job to be on top of what they are uncomfortable with their child reading and to opt their child out of it. And, and beyond that, I trust educators and experts and especially librarians to make choices about what is what my child reads. Joe Smith, what role should parents have in being able to shape the instructional materials within a classroom? Well, you know, it's, you gotta, it's important to understand that, that we don't have a lot of say in curriculum. When, when we want to look at a particular curriculum that's going to be taught across the district, you know, the state may give us two or three choices, and then we have to pick uh, from those choices they give us. And that's in terms of curriculum. Now, what happened when the pandemic hit and parents really started paying attention to what their kids were being taught, what they were reading, and uh, what they were checking out of libraries, and, and a lot of parents became concerned uh, a lot of parents became angry uh, about, and, and so that's what's, what's been all the discussion of, uh, about what our kids are, are being exposed to. And boy, I encourage parents, know what your child is reading. And, you know, we've got the technology now. I know a school in our district that uh, Loftus Middle School, when a child checks out a book that, that maybe has obscene language or something in it, that, that librarian or, or uh, Dr. Gatlin, they alert the parent. And then the parent has the right to say, no, I don't want my child reading that book. But candidly, I'm glad parents are in more involved in what their kids are seeing and reading. Jen, any other comments on that subject? Uh, no. All right, next up, a question from Jace Moses. That's a student in District 3. And uh, it is on the topic of early post-secondary opportunities, which are courses and, and or exams that give students a chance to obtain post-secondary credit while still in high school. Here's Jace. Hello, my name is Jace Moses. I am a senior at Hickson High School. And my question to you is, how are you going to ensure that all Hamilton County students are prepared for multiple post-secondary opportunities, starting with opportunities for students while they're in middle school and throughout their high school journey. All right, Jace, thank you so much for that. Joe Smith, you get first crack at this one. Jace is a really good baseball player up at Hickson High School, let me tell you. You know, we, we've done a pretty good job of, of offering students the option to uh, to dual enroll. And I remember a few years back, my, my uh, youngest daughter, got involved in that process. When she graduated from high school, she was a, a sophomore in college. So we've, we've got those opportunities. We need to continue to expand those opportunities and make sure that every child that's interested uh, has the ability to access those op opportunities. And, and uh, so good for this young man. All right, Jen. Right now, our school counselors are overburdened with having to uh, work on schedule changes, work on um, helping to proctor standardized testing. Uh, they don't have the time that they need. And also, frankly, I don't believe there are enough of them uh, to really focus on helping kids uh, do career counseling. That's something I did, like I said, as a vocational rehab counselor uh, to figure out what type of career they might be most suited for. That is a really vital piece in terms of making sure that they are taking the classes that they should be taking to get ahead. Because if they're just kind of grabbing classes, trying to do what they think they should, they might be wasting their time. So I think it would be very important for us to uh, free up the time of our school counselors so that they can focus on counseling. All right, Joe, do you have anything? Let me just add that, that for years we, we had uh, college counselors and they were part-time people. So in other words, a counselor might serve two or three different high schools. Two years ago, I fought to make those guys full-time. I led that charge to make that happen. And now we've got those 
counselors in our high schools and they're not part-time anymore, they're full-time. And that's a great resource for students to reach out to. So I would encourage uh, every student, if you don't know who that person is, you ask somebody because they're there and they're available to you. All right, next question. And, you know, I've been covering schools a long time and this question, honest to goodness, I could have asked in the 1990s, but here we are and it's, uh, it's still accurate. Hamilton County's three poorest performing schools for third grade literacy serve large population of students of color. Hamilton County's three best performing schools serve primarily white students. How can the school board address disparities like this? And Jen Pyroth, you go first on this one. I was at the uh, school board meeting when they discussed the equity plan. I was impressed. I was hopeful. I felt uh, really proud to be part of a school district and to have my kids attend a school district where there was such a focus on, uh, on equity. Uh, after the presentation was over, or maybe it was during the presentation, uh, we had a school board member, Rhonda Thurman, who said aloud that she didn't know what equity was. That was very embarrassing to me. And I was offended, honestly, as a parent to have somebody say that out loud. I mean, uh, you can look that up in a dictionary. <laughs> uh, I, I think we need to really listen to people, listen to people of color, listen to people who are struggling. I know my, uh, Caritza uh, works tirelessly for her district. I know probably some of those schools are in her district. Uh, I would like to listen, listen to people about what they need and give it to them because that is true equity. All right, Joe. You know, uh, our kids are in our schools 18% of their life, 18%. That means the other 82% they're either at home or they're in the community. They're someone other than the schoolhouse. We hadn't done a good job of teaching our kids to read, but it's so important that we understand that, that the teachers need help too. And, and the parents have got to get engaged. The community has to get engaged in, in, in these kids' lives. The parent is so vitally important. I want to say this real quick. Of all these kids that, that we brought into our home and they, we raised, we always gave them the option to either come to our zone schools, which was in Hickson, or to stay at their school. In 2006, we had six kids, six different schools. My wife would load them up in the van in the morning, go to six different schools. But here's what happened. After they were with us for a while, their behavior changed. They weren't getting suspended anymore. Their grades became, began to come up. They're at the same school, they're at the same building, the same friends, the same teachers. The only thing that had changed was the home. And I don't know how we fix that. I don't know how we fix that. The home is vitally important. Teachers need the parents to get engaged to help them. Jen, do you have a rebuttal on that? Oh, just to say that, you know, as a as a person, as a parent, as a school board member, I, we have absolutely no control over that. We have control over what our schools do and how we can help from the perspective of our schools. And that's why I believe so much in the equity plan. Joe, you served in the school board, uh, as you said, for six years. And Jen, you're vying for the seat after working as a, as a teacher. Question to both of you is this, what is the one thing you think the school board should do differently starting next year? We'll start with you, Joe Smith. What, what, if anything, should the school board do differently next to you in your mind? Well, we, we've got to continue to make sure it's a safe place. And so we've got to get these security officers in place and make sure that our buildings are secure and do everything we can uh, to make sure, first and foremost, that our kids are, are, are going to a safe place. And then we have got tremendous, I mean, it's really a crisis uh, with the need to, to repair uh, our buildings. We probably need to close some schools, combine some schools. Uh, One billion with a B almost uh, dollars worth of needs, it's gotta be done. And we've waited a long time and this just keeps getting kicked down the road. We've got to address that issue, it's crisis. In Pyroth, what, if you're elected, what would you want the school board to do differently than it has? 
uh, when you first asked the question, I thought you meant uh, the meetings themselves. Uh, I guess, uh, so I'm a, a little bit uh, taken aback by that. We, uh, my goodness, I, I would like to see uh, less committees, less talking about uh, what we think we might do and more uh, actionable change. There's, you know, just like my opponent said, there has been, that can has been kicked, that can should be in pieces by now, that can has been kicked so long. Uh, and frankly, uh, you know, my opponent's been on the school board for the past six years while that can's been kicked. So I, you know, I would like to see things actually happen instead of just a bunch of discussions. Joe, is there a way to make things happen more quickly than that? Well, have? you know, you got to count to five. You got to count to five, get anything done. And I said this last night, sometimes it seems like the, you know, the board's kind of like the federal government, you know, we'll jump over a dime or a dollar to pick up a dime. And we talked about a resolution last night for an hour and it came time to talk about performance and it lasted 10 minutes. So um, the school board's got to, got to work together and put political agendas aside and agree. There's a lot of things that we can agree on. So let's pick out those things that we do agree on uh, and, and not spend so much energy on the things that we don't uh, agree on. All right, we've got you two booked for an hour. We want you to get your money's worth, and we are running a little bit ahead of schedule here. So uh, Dave and I are, are blessed with the opportunity to throw in an extra question or two at our peril. <laughs> so here's <laughs> one for you. Um, this is the first time we've had partisan school board races. And it's the first time that uh, anyone has ever declared as a Democrat or a Republican on a Hamilton County School Board ballot. Joe has declared as a Republican. Jen has declared as a Democrat. So um, on this one, let's see, we just turn what it be. It would be Jen to go first on this. You declare as a Democrat. What does that mean? Uh, does this mean, uh, are, are you hopeful that more people will vote for you because you're a Democrat? And what will it mean in your overall philosophy on things? It's interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, I had thought about initially running as an independent because I was against uh, I was against us uh, against it being partisan. Uh, but of course, as a first time candidate, you think how how do you how do you even do this? So the uh, Democratic Party has been incredibly helpful to me, and I'm grateful for them. I did choose to uh, register as a Democrat because they clearly, repeatedly over and over again, obviously care much more about public schools than I've seen from the Republican party. In terms of um, how my behavior might be different because we've uh, declared, it, it wouldn't be at all. I, I'm, uh, I, I have to, uh, and I, I'm, I would be honored to represent my constituents, not any political party at all. And uh, frankly, Republicans are my family. My parents are both uh, Republicans. Hi, mom and dad. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I have lots of family that's Republicans, I have friends that are Republicans. I have lots of friends that are uh, of all political persuasion. So that would not affect my behavior at all. All right. Now, Joe Smith, she did say that, if I understood correctly, that Democrats largely care more about. Yeah, I heard, I heard that comment, too. I, that's a little bit unfair, I think. But, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is, is even though until this year that school board races uh, uh, have not been partisan or you didn't declare as a Republican or as a Democrat, it's it's operated that way. And, and I think that, that uh, whoever has served on that board, me included, when we make a decision about something or a vote about something, we're going to look, look through the lens of whatever our particular uh, ideology uh, might be. Uh, I've been a conservative Republican all my life, and I live in a district that's largely conservative Republican. And uh, I think you'll find that the voting history for this district has been that. Uh, but David, I, I'm, I'm going to make votes and decisions based on, first of all, uh, what the people that hire me to do this job, that's the taxpayers, what, what they want and what they feel like they need and what's in the best interest of, of kids and, and students. And sometimes that falls uh, good to Democrats, some good to Republicans. Dave, did you have an additional question? 
As just earlier this month, we just recently, we, we got some new TCAP scores showing some improvement from Hamilton County schools and the best test results by the state standardized test measurements in five years, actually. But uh, nonetheless, you know, only 36% of Hamilton County students in grades three to 10, 12, I'm sorry, were at or above grade level in English and, and only 44% of social, social studies were at or above grade level. I wonder overall how you think how you would characterize Hamilton County, how they are doing in, in education. Do you think stand, state standardized tests are a, a reliable indicator of how they're doing? And what, if any, changes can we make or should we make to try to improve performance if you think, uh, if we need to? And this question goes to you first, Joe Smith. How do you well, evaluate the, the test scores and, and how we, we're doing and what can we do to make it better? You know, we talked a little bit about that last night. It was a brief conversation, so they wanted to talk about the resolution for so long. But uh, we're, we're not where we need to be. Now, if you compare where we're at uh, to the rest of the state, we're outscoring the state in about three-fourths of the tested areas. So can we be glad of that? Yeah, we can be glad of that, but it's not good enough. And so we've got work to do. Now, one thing I do feel good about is, you know, a lot of schools during the pandemic, they didn't go to school. You know, we were in school in Hamilton County almost 90% of the time, higher than any district in the state. And so our learning loss was just not what we were afraid it was going to be. So that's something to feel good about. But we've got, we've got a lot of work to do. Jen Pyroth, how would you evaluate our schools where we're at now? And do you think state standardized tests are a good measure of, of what their success is? I think that uh, standardized testing has its place. I think that kids are tested to death. And I think that teachers are absolutely overwhelmed with the requirements of standardized testing. I think that teachers need more time to teach, less time focusing on testing. I also mentioned before that uh, school counselors, school support staff, are, uh, their time is taken up with proctoring tests, with uh, things like that. I, I think that we test far too much. Any rebuttal, Joe? Any other comments? She's right. We, 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 you get, you've got to have some kind of measure. I mean, testing is necessary of some kind, but the experts, the teachers tell me that we're testing too much and what that is doing, it's robbing instruction time. So uh, uh, we got to take a look at that. And again, that's not controlled by the local school board. I wish it was. That's controlled uh, by the state. All right. This is the go ahead. Yes. Can I, can I say something? Sure. Oh, I just wanted to say also with all this testing, I can I can speak as a mother for my children. I, it makes you know some kids don't care. They they get right through it. My two daughters get incredibly anxious with the testing, wanting to make sure they do a good job. They're worried that their teacher's job is at stake, you know, because of how they do on this test, you know, related to how much funding their school's going to get. They're aware of all this stuff that I don't even think they should be aware of. They shouldn't have that kind of pressure on them for, uh, you know, whether it's going to affect school funding. Uh, so anyway, I, I just think there's just so much pressure on kids already, and we don't need to to add all of that with the repetitive testing. All right. Thank you both for allowing us to put a bonus question or two in there. Now it's your turn. Uh, we ask each of the candidates to pose a question to your opponent. It can be about whatever topic you want. If there's something that's been said or done in this campaign that uh, you'd like to get cleared up, here's your moment. You each have a uh, chance to ask a question, and the um, respondent will have one minute. So, Jen, you go first. Ask your question to Joe Smith. Sure. Thank you. On May 10th, uh, Joe, you posted on Facebook that you were particularly happy about the budget that was passed by the school board giving teachers a 3% raise. Inflation was 8% last year. So, please explain why you were particularly happy about teachers receiving a 5% pay cut. Well, they didn't. They didn't get a five percent pay cut. I mean, it, all of us are are uh, suffering right now through inflation, uh, and so they didn't. They didn't get a five percent pay cut. They got a three percent pay raise. A few days, few weeks prior to that, several members of, of the board were willing to settle for just giving them a one percent raise. 
And if you were paying attention, you'll see that Joe Smith fought and said, let's just wait and let's see what funding we're going to get from the state and let's give our teachers a better than a 1% raise. And then when we found out what we were getting from the state, we were able to give them a 3% raise. So, yes, I felt very good about that. Joe, your chance to ask Jen Pyroth whatever you want. Jen, my first uh, my first two years of serving on board, it's kind of like drinking water out of a fire hose <laughs> and trying to understand everything that goes on and, and who people are. Uh, you've got four young children, and, uh, and I admire your willingness to step up and want to serve. I just wonder how in the world are you going to manage your time to do what we do as school board members with four children? That's going to be a... A, a challenge? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So uh, my job that I have now is very flexible. I can uh, choose to work or not work uh, on certain days. And so I would be able to uh, meet with teachers when it was convenient for them to meet with, you know, whoever I needed to. I'm also, of course, free in the evenings. My partner, James, is very supportive and wonderful, you know, with our kids. So I, I don't have concerns about that. This is important enough to me that I would absolutely make the time for that. Thank you, candidates. And that brings us to the end of the questions for tonight's debate. Now each of you will be can conclude with a closing statements. And Jen Pyroth, please give us your closing statement. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, many times throughout the course of this campaign, People have asked me, why are you running? Like my opponent uh, just said, how would I have time? They said, you're, you work full time, you have four kids, your uh, hobbies are fostering dogs and uh, rehabbing retro furniture. Why, why on earth would you wanna run for school board and why right now when you have young kids? Well, I am running because I have watched the current school board spend their time discussing the meaning of words available in a dictionary I am running because I have watched the current school board form committees to address board members' feelings rather than support teachers, students, and families in concrete ways. I am running because I believe in expanding arts education. I believe in teachers teaching more than testing. I believe educated and expert voices need to be the loudest voices in every room. I believe in the power of the right book at the right time. If the direction that the school board has gone lately feels right to you, then I encourage you to keep voting for it. But if you, like me, want more opportunity for our children, more accessibility for everyone, more experts in our classrooms, and more funding for our buildings, then I am fired up and ready to serve. And I hope that you will vote for me on August 4th. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Joe Smith, your closing statement. Thank you, and 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 this, let me once again thank uh, Channel Three and and Two Point Oh and Times Free Press for doing this. Thank you to my opponent for being here. For the past six years, I've worked tirelessly for uh, District Three, and you know I have a hard time talking about the things that I've done or reasons you need to reelect me, I, I guess my best resource would be go talk to the principals, go talk to the to the uh, teachers, talk to students in District 3 and ask them about Joe Smith's work over the last six years. And there's a lot of things that I still want to get done up here in District 3. And I'm real excited about what you're going to hear in the next few days about a lot of things that's going to happen in every one of our schools in District 3 in terms of repairs and new equipment and new opportunities for kids. And I'm very excited about, about what's coming down the pike that the public will be hearing about here in just a few days. I want to continue to serve. My life has been about serving kids. I've raised 19 plus two of my own. 16 of those 19 are today productive, contributing members of society who nobody gave a chance. And again, one of the things that happened, really the only thing that was different in their life is they had a, a stable home and parents that were involved and held them accountable. 
and I want to continue to be that. I see 16 kids every day from at-risk families in a program that I, I direct, and I'm going to continue to love on them. Whether re-elected or not, I'm going to get up August 5th and continue to do what I've done for the past 30 years. The people in District 3 know me. They trust me. They understand my work. And I believe they're going to support me. And it's real interesting to learn tonight that Democrats care more about public education than do Republicans. Thank you guys so much for doing this. All right. Thank you both. And I think I can speak uh, confidently on behalf of our friends at the Times Free Press and Chattanooga 2.0 on uh, being so appreciative of both of you for the lives you've led and the accomplishments that you've achieved and for putting yourselves on the ballot this year. It's um, not a glamorous or rewarding profession or not a position, I should say. I think most anyone who's ever served on the school board would be the first to tell you that. So I'm very appreciative that you're willing to serve. And I know that as uh, you both mentioned, what, whatever the results of the election, you're gonna continue to serve. And we're grateful for that. And on that, I'd like to turn it over to the executive director of Chattanooga 2.0, Carrie Randolph. Thanks, David. And I'll echo um, your thanks to the candidates. Thank you, candidates, for participating and again for your interest in serving in this vital leadership role. Thank you to our moderators, David and Dave, um, Local 3 News and the Chattanooga Times Free Press. Um, thank you to Jace, the student from Hickson High School, and the many community members who submitted excellent questions. And last but not least, thank you to you, our viewers. If you missed the first part of tonight's debate for District 3, the video recording will be available later this evening on Local 3 News YouTube channel and timesfreepress.com. Tomorrow night, July 20th, we will be right back here at 7 p.m. for the District 5 school board debate between Caritza Mosley-Jones and Charles Patey. Don't forget that early voting is taking place now through July 30th. The deadline to request an absentee ballot is July 28th. I encourage you to head over to chat2, that's C-H-A-T-T, -T, the number two, dot org slash vote, where you will find more information about the candidates, the upcoming election on August 4th, and how to request your absentee ballot. In closing, 2022 has been another trying year for our community. Strong leadership on the Hamilton County School Board is needed now more than ever, as we continue to make Hamilton County Schools the best school district in the state of Tennessee. And so I thank you for your engagement on this critical topic. Have a good evening and stay safe out there.